So uh, that will be, let's say, um, an introduction of uh, the basics of uh, Manet's work uh, from the lens of Luncheon on the grass. So to discuss this first part, I will ask this particular, particular question. Is this painting a classical or a modern painting? Because as I mentioned earlier uh, with uh, my discussion in, uh, with Sylvain, um, I, I said that this is the beginning of modernity in art. But if you look at it, you may spontaneously see it as a classical painting. And uh, that's actually very, very interesting because that's the whole, um, let's say, value of this particular artwork. It's inherited from the classical art history, but paving the way for modernity in art. So we are exactly at a turning point here uh, for, uh, for art. So between classical and modern art. So if I speak about modern art, you may have more in mind this kind of painting like Mondrian, but let's, um, let's discuss first uh, about the uh, classical roots of this particular artwork before moving on to modernity. So if you observe the composition, the composition is, um, is very distinctive and art historians find out that there was a deep, deep connection with old masters. Now observe this, other artwork, try to observe in detail. So this artwork is actually a print that was actually made from an original painting by Raphael that has been lost. So we know only uh, the Raphael painting through the uh, Raimondi print, okay? So that's why it's in black and white, but there was an original uh, painting, old painting. So try to observe it and try to anticipate the connection with Lancheon on the grass. Okay. So for some, some of you may have seen this particular part. You can see the exact composition that Manet have reintroduced in Lancheon on the grass. But obviously here in the original work, it's related to Paris, so uh, to uh, a very prestigious uh, uh, history, mythology, and so on. So uh, it's uh, the representation of, um, let's say, high uh, culture. But the big twist of Manet is actually to keep the same composition, but bring it into a very common setting a forest probably in the suburb of, uh, of Paris with um, four young French people sitting on the grass. And uh, so now it's quite obvious uh, to, uh, to see the inspiration of, uh, of Manet because again, the composition is really, really similar. But we also know that Manet himself spent a lot of time in Louvre Museum what you see now is actually a copy by Edouard Manet, a copy that he made from Titian, another old master. So it's very important to remember that uh, in his early years, actually Edouard Manet spent a lot of time in museum. At that time, also museum didn't exist. Everything was at Louvre Museum. And um, to train himself, following the tips, the, the advice of, um, of some influential uh, uh, teachers, he uh, then copied. And here is again the, um, the uh, Manes copy, and here is the original uh, Titian, the Virgin of the Rabbit. So very strong interest in classical art. And here you can see actually on your uh, left-hand side, the original one, and on your right hand side, the copy by Edouard Manet. So as you can see, it's deeply in the composition rooted 
uh, in uh, classical art. But that's not the end. This painting is very, very important because um, there is this connection, but there are also uh, different, uh, a lot of change, major change. The first one that I want to mention is actually in terms of brushstrokes. Here you have another artwork by Gustave Courbet, uh, a realist painter. So I show it uh, here because uh, the theme is similar, uh, two women sitting in the forest, but you can see that the style is very different. It's what we say realistic. The uh, brushstrokes are very detailed, so detail that you actually don't see them anymore. It has the aspect of something that is almost photographic. Uh, the illusion is almost perfect. Uh, you, um, you, you know, you get that it's an old painting, but then you don't see the gesture of the, the artist. But that's actually something that Manet completely changed. Here is a close shot of the artist. It's a picture I took in front of the painting. So you see my finger here. Um, and um, you can see that you, you clearly notice the brushstrokes of, uh, of the painter. And we are used now to see that, but Manet uh, for the first time really uh, started uh, this kind of inner revolution in uh, the uh, Western art world. Um, to really um, also use the medium painting as a way to express himself, not just to represent the world, but the movement, the brushstrokes are also expressing um, the, um, the will of the artist. Um, you can also notice this in uh, the upper part uh, of the painting. Here you have uh, a small bird flying. So just for you to locate this bird, it's located here, right in the middle on the top. Okay, so uh, it's a very interesting element because that brings a, a, a sense of spontaneity, um, uh, but at the same time, the surrounding, as you can see, it's, um, it's very uh, vivid. You can clearly identify all the brushstrokes of, uh, of the artist different tones of greens. So um, regarding the palette uh, is still using, let's say, um, color that are close to nature. Uh, we will see that some artists later on will change that, uh, but he insists on what I will call the pictorialness of uh, his artwork. He doesn't want to create any illusion anymore. The painting is still figurative. It's still representational, but he wants to add uh, this, let's say, um, particular element that is painting in itself. The media uh, is now standing out. And uh, here it's in the lower part. You can see also uh, a small frog uh, in the lower uh, left-hand side. So he's also uh, very uh, free in his uh, uh, way of composing the, the canvas. He's not following uh, any rule. So now, why such, uh, let's say, um, why so much freedom in terms of brushstrokes? One possible explanation actually is the appearance of photography. Um, so this painting, as you uh, notice, was uh, shown for the first time in 1863. Photography started to develop earlier than that, about, um, about 40 years earlier. Uh, in the, uh, or, or, or yeah, 30 years, something like that, uh, in the 1830s. So besides the will of Manet to really unleash the brushstroke, there is probably also the idea that photography now can represent the world. So why, why sticking to realism, whereas photography can uh, actually take a, a, a shot of uh, of the real world. So of course, uh, all over the 19th century was black and white uh, picture, such as those two portraits of Edouard Manet himself by a famous photographer called Nadar. Uh, but we also know uh, that Manet 
uh, have included photography in his uh, way of painting. There is a famous portrait of uh, Clemenceau. He uh, used photograph of Clemenceau partly because he could not actually um, get Clemenceau long enough to pose in his studio. So um, I, I do think that um, uh, there was a way for uh, Manet at this stage to emancipate actually painting from a purely uh, representational uh, perspective. So, um, because that was actually a way for painting to survive beside photography. And I'll begin to develop this during the uh, Q&A session if you, uh, if you like. And before moving uh, on to the second part, I also want to show here another artwork that is not, as you can see, by uh, Edouard Manet, but representing Edouard Manet in his studio here. Uh, and it's uh, made by Henri Fantin Latour, but different, uh, definitely different style. I would say closer to uh, Courbet than uh, to uh, Manet. But what is very interesting all over his life, Edouard Manet has cultivated friendship and uh, dialogue with very diverse artists and very diverse writers and philosophers. Uh, his talent was so unique that he attracted the attention of very different uh, profile from the realist writer um, Zola to uh, a poet uh, called uh, Gautier uh, that is definitely not into realism. But as is shaking actually all the uh, academic rule uh, of, uh, of the, the front of that time, uh, he uh, definitely draw uh, a lot of attention. 